Hey everyone, it's Mr. Wistar again. Uh, in this lesson, we're going to talk about how to use preconditions and postconditions to document our code more effectively and try to insulate us from errors. Um, we'll talk about what pre- and postconditions are and why they're helpful, uh, and then we'll talk about some guidelines for writing uh, good versions of uh, both things. Uh, and we'll, lastly, we'll talk about a command that you can use to enforce your preconditions called assert. So, what are pre- and postconditions? Well, the easiest way to think about them are they are the conditions that have to be true before a method runs and the conditions that have to be true after a method runs. Um, it's not, they're not actually executable code. Uh, we're not going to be adding any code to our program um, today until we get to assert. Um, but they are ways of documenting your code so that people who use it um, can use it effectively. Basically, um, it's like you're setting up a contract with the people who use your code that says, as long as you promise to use my method the way that I told you to, um, then I guarantee that it'll produce the correct results. And what that means, the flip side of that, is that if they don't satisfy your preconditions, then you're off the hook. You can pretty much do whatever you want. Um, there are a lot of benefits to using pre- and post-conditions. Uh, one of the biggest reasons is that it helps insulate you from user errors. Um, it both explains to the user what they need to understand and follow when they use your method, and it sort of gives you a built-in excuse. Because uh, again, if someone doesn't follow the preconditions, then you know, you're just like, well, <laughs> sorry, um, better luck next time. So from that standpoint, it's helpful. Uh, but it's also really helpful for you as the programmer. I'm a big believer that the more you can document in the comments for a method, the easier it is to actually write the method. Most of the time, I actually write the comments for a method before I start writing the code because it helps me, kind of in my mind, picture the design for the method that I'm, that I'm going to write. And the preconditions and postconditions are the big part of that. Uh, postconditions help you make sure that your method is satisficing, um, which that's not the same as satisfying. Satisficing means that it meets the needs of the person using the method. So what you should do when you're finished a method is take a look at the post conditions and make sure that they really match up with what it is that you had intended to do. Okay, but let's talk about preconditions first. Preconditions, um, they are the conditions that have to be true before a method runs and they really fall into two basic categories. One is about what has to be true about the state of your program and that means uh, what has to be true about any class variables, uh, what has to be true about any objects that this method is going to collaborate with? Um, what has to be true in your program in order for this method to work? And then the second type of preconditions, which we've already uh, become pretty familiar with, are um, conditions for the parameter variables. Uh, we've been documenting our parameter variables all along, but we've never really specified uh, any restrictions on the values that you can use for them. And so you really want to take a look at those parameters, try to think about which kinds of parameter variables would break your method and make sure that you write a precondition that tells the user not to do that. Um, we're going to put all of our preconditions and all of our postconditions in the body of the method. And we'll take a look at that um, in a little bit. You want to try to avoid preconditions uh, if you can um, because essentially every precondition for your method is a documented limitation. If you have a method without any preconditions, that means that it works all the time, or at least it doesn't crash. Um, and so if you can, it's better to try to take that limitation and account for it inside your method by maybe using if statements or some other technique. But ultimately, sometimes there are some conditions that are either too awkward to handle or just impossible to handle. Um, and you have to make sure that there are preconditions. If you do handle error conditions for your um, program state or your parameters inside your method, they're not a precondition. Anything that happens inside your method is not a precondition. Okay, on the flip side, um, let's talk about post conditions. Again, you have to sort of document both um, two different things. One is, how has the state of my program changed as a result of calling this method? How are my class variables different? What other objects have changed? Don't worry about your local variables. Don't worry about your parameter variables. Remember, those are going to evaporate when the method is done, so you don't need to document what's happened to them. But you do need to document anything that is going to be 
persistent, anything that's going to be true after the method is done. And you also need to document your return values. Um, most of the time you can cover all of this in your at return tag. So if you're already covering um, everything that you need to in your at return tag, then you don't need an additional post condition for that. And don't, don't repeat your, uh, the information in your at return tag in a post condition. That's just a waste of typing. So, but make sure you document changes in your program state and make sure that you're using your at return tag if you have any post conditions. And again, we're going to put post conditions in the header for our, our method, in the comment for our method, just like our preconditions. So, what are you going to do? Um, what should your method do if the user doesn't satisfy the preconditions? Um, you have a couple of choices. You can throw an exception, um, which uh, is sometimes a good idea. It will tell the person who um, is calling your method that something very bad has happened because it will make their program crash, or it will force them in their coding to handle it um, by doing something called exception handling. Uh, one of the downsides to using uh, exceptions is that they happen all the time. And sometimes um, you want to be checking for preconditions when you are um, running your program, and sometimes you don't. So uh, there's a uh, more flexible way of doing that called using the assert command, which we'll talk about in a minute. The assert command allows you to throw an exception but only if you have assertions turned on. Then of course there's option number three which is just you know go on and do whatever. Um, that's uh, <laughs> that's kind of a dangerous way to program. I wouldn't really recommend that. Um, you you know no matter how much you document your preconditions and explain to the user that they were an idiot they're still gonna feel like it's your fault. And so if I were you I would try to figure out some way to um, reject the user's input um, in a, as graceful a way as possible. So let's talk about how assert works. Um, the assert command throws an exception. It always throws a special kind of exception called assert exception. Uh, and the syntax for that command is you just say assert and then you put in some sort of boolean condition. Anything that evaluates to true or false. Um, anything that you could legally put inside of an if statement you can put after an assert command. You don't need parentheses you just put the condition and it'll get evaluated um, and if it's um, false then your program will crash. If you have assertions turned on and like I mentioned before you have the ability in your um, when you run a program a Java program to either turn assertions on or turn them off and you can also turn them on and off in JGrasp. And I'll show you how to do that right now. But let's talk about preconditions and postconditions first. Um, here we are back in the good old um, expression parser uh, and we're going to talk about pre and post conditions for a, a couple of the methods. Um, let's talk about this method. This is actually a new method um, that I just wrote which uh, its purpose is to take the user's input and break it up into the pieces, the numbers, the symbols, to chop it up into the array list that we're going to use up here when we convert it to postfix. But if you take a look at this method, um, remember we're going to put our pre and post conditions in the method comment, which still has to look like a method comment. So we'll say converts users input to a list of tokens. We still need to use at param and at return tags, even if we add pre and post conditions. So input is the user's input. All right. Now let's think about preconditions for this method. And I actually think if you think about it, um, there are, there is a really important precondition for this method, which is that the tokens have to be separated um, by white space, by at least one space. Remember, if you put all the, if you just write three plus four like that, then um, Java's going to think that that's one big token called 3 plus 4. Well, what you need the user to type in is 3 space plus space 4. And so we're going to document that as a precondition so that we don't have to add a lot of really complicated code to try to sort that out. One thing I didn't mention in the slides, um, which is worth mentioning here, is that 
you're not going to see pre and post conditions in the HTML documentation. They just exist here in the uh, source code that someone who uses your program is going to look at. Um, all right, let's go on and write post conditions. Um, so this method doesn't return anything, so actually I don't need a return value, but it does have a post condition because it uses this class variable which contains the list of tokens. And so our post conditions is, our post condition is going to be my tokens contains the tokens in the user's input. So that's a perfect example of a method that has both a precondition and a postcondition. As long as the user satisfies this precondition, then we have to we have to promise that we're going to satisfy that postcondition. And really quickly, let's write a precondition or let's write pre and post conditions for our run method. Um, so runs the program. What has to be true before the program runs? Well, nothing. So we don't have any preconditions. And you don't have to write anything if there aren't any pre or post conditions. Um, just skip that step. As far as post conditions go, well, let's see. Are we modifying any class variables? Yeah, actually we are. Um, we're going to be modifying the value of my tokens. So I guess we should say pretty much the same thing as what we said for the last method. Um, except I'm going to be a little more specific. Because there's a loop here, it's going to always contain the list of tokens that the user typed in last. Um, if they run, if they type in five equations, um, then whatever the fifth one is is the one that my tokens is going to contain the list of tokens for. All right, compile our program. All right, let's talk about the assert command. So here's an example of a place where having assert might be helpful. So let's say your user comes along, they run your program, they just hit the enter key. Well, that's not good because when it comes time to evaluate our expression, the stack is empty, which never happens, or it's not supposed to happen, and so your program crashes with an empty stack exception. So what we could do, let's try this. We could put in this assert command. Um, and what this says essentially is assert that the length of the input um, is greater than zero. So we already had that in there. Why didn't our program crash when we ran it? Well, remember when we talked when we were talking about assert, we said that assert commands only run if you have assertions turned on. You can choose to have them turned on or turned off. And right now I have them turned off. So here's how in JGrasp you turn on assertions. You go to the compiler settings, and then you go to the flags tab right here. And what you need to do is go over here underneath run, uncheck this box, and type dash EA. That stands for enable assertions. So make sure that this is unchecked and you see dash EA. Click apply and OK. And now let's see what happens when we run our program. Now when we hit enter, we actually get an assertion error. Um, and the program um, stops at the place where we have the assert command, which is more helpful because it shows us uh, why our program um, isn't going to work properly rather than just some weird empty stack exception that you might have a hard time figuring out. Okay, so what did we talk about in this lesson? We talked about the importance of having pre and post conditions. We talked about how and where you should put them in the comments for your methods. And then we talked about using the assert command to enforce our preconditions and make our program crash if we needed to. All right, you're all set.